Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. Today I'm going to do a video uh, that I feel is appropriate for this point in my journey on booktube. I've been making videos, reviews, recommendations, those types of videos for a couple of months now and I think that it's time for me to put together a series of videos outlining my favorite fantasy standalones and my favorite adult fantasy series. I'm hoping that these videos might help uh, newcomers to the channel or people who might be interested in subscribing or following along. It might give them a representation of my tastes and the kinds of books that I like and the kinds of things that I like about books. So today I'm going to go through my top 10 fantasy standalones and then in a couple of days I will upload a video talking about my favorite adult fantasy series. And I will just get right into it because I think these videos can become a little bit lengthy and I will go from the number 10 position all the way up to number one. So kicking things off at number 10 for my favorite fantasy standalones is the novel Nation by Terry Pratchett, which is not a Discworld novel. It was published independent of the Discworld and it came out in 2009. So this is a coming of age novel that focuses on two main characters. We have the character of Mao, who is a, a young indigenous man who is just at the cusp of adulthood and is just about to go through his kind of initiation rite or his initiation ritual to pass from childhood into manhood. And then we have the second character of Ermintrude, who's a young woman of some nobility who is on a cross Atlantic or cross, I guess it's not the Atlantic because this takes place in an alternate universe, but a, a cross oceanic voyage um, and whose vessel becomes embroiled in a typhoon and she ends up shipwrecked and separated from the rest of her crew. So Ermintrude washes up on the beach where Mao is supposed to be undergoing this ritual or these rites to pass into manhood. Unfortunately, the typhoon has also hit Mao's village and has killed all of the other members of his tribe. So as the novel moves forward, we, we get to watch this fledgling friendship and partnership between Mao and Ermintrude develop, uh, two people from very different worldviews, two very different experiences, how they become uh, closer, how they start to trust each other, and how they start to build up the relationship that be that's between the two of them. There's also a lot of exploration of the nature of religion and Mao becomes very disillusioned with his god uh, as this typhoon hits right at the time of his ritual and kills the rest of the members of his tribe. So we see him struggling with his faith, trying to come to terms with what, is, what has happened, while also being introduced to Ermintrude and all of these kind of alien ways of life and these alien belief systems. It was a really impactful novel when I read it. So I read it upon its release. So that is more than a decade ago now. And I still think about it from time to time. I still remember the feeling that I had when I was finished this book. And that was the feeling that I didn't think there was anything that Terry Pratchett could have done differently or should have done differently. I think that he wrote exactly the novel that he had set out to write and that all of the various themes, the character development, the plotting, everything was done in, I think, the best possible way for that book. I don't think it is the best book that I have ever read, but I think that it was very moving. Uh, it gave me a lot to think about, and I really enjoyed Terry Pratchett's writing style. That was my first introduction to his writing, and it made me want to go on and read more from him. So definitely recommend this one if you're looking for a short fantasy standalone. If you enjoy that coming of age and the exploration of the themes that I talked about, then 100% you should give that one a try. Uh, number nine on my list is one that I puzzled over a little bit because I knew that I wanted to put a book by Neil Gaiman on this list and he has so many fantastic fantasy standalones but the one that I had to put on here that needed to be on my list is actually the children's book Fortunately the Milk. So 
Again, I love Neil Gaiman. He is one of my favorite authors. I think that he is one of the most versatile fantasy authors who is writing today. He can write anything from picture books to early children's books to YA books to adult books, and he does it all with such flair. There's such a sense of magic that imbues every book that Neil Gaiman writes. But the book, Fortunately the Milk, is the first fantasy love of both of my kids. And for that reason, and for the joy that it brought me when I was reading it to them, I needed to include it on this list. Do I think that it is Neil Gaiman's best book? No, I do not. It is certainly not his most complex book. I think that there are lots of fantasy standalones that are worthy of being on anyone's list, but this book was such a rich experience when I was reading it to my kids. They enjoyed it, they loved it so much that they reread it, they picked it up, they played with it over and over, they wanted to play Fortunately the Milk, they wanted to draw pictures of Fortunately the Milk. We have their their rough kind of little toddler paintings that depict scenes from Fortunately the Milk that hang up in their playroom. It just meant a lot to them and because of that reading it to them meant a lot to me. So I will always have such fondness for this book that I needed to include it on this list. Uh, the setup of Fortunately the Milk is very basic. Uh, it is about a dad who is caring for his two children because their mom is out of town and he runs out of milk before breakfast. So there's no milk for their cereal and there's no milk for his tea. So he runs to the corner store to pick up some milk and on his way back he is abducted by aliens. And from there we come across a kind of cross-dimensional, cross-time, uh, very Whovian exploration of the universe uh, as this dad tries to find his way back to his children with the milk intact. It is delightful. It will probably take a half an hour to read if you're an adult. It only takes about an hour or so to read aloud to your kids. But if you have young kids who love fantasy or if you're just in the mood for a really silly, whimsical middle grade novel, then I would highly recommend that you pick this one up. Number eight on this list is a novel called Swords Point by Ellen Kushner. So this is a book that I read quite some time ago. I read it, I think, in my late teens or early 20s, and it is a low fantasy novel. So it is fantasy in the sense that it is set in an alternate universe. So it does not take place on Earth, but that is the only fantastic element uh, that makes up this story. It is modeled in the style of kind of an Austin comedy of manners. So there is a main character whose name is Saint Vere, and he is the most revered swordsman in the city of Riverside. And so he's a swordsman for hire and he will do anything for money. So you can hire him to kill someone, you can hire him to duel someone, you can hire him to challenge someone. And for this reason, he lives a very dangerous lifestyle and does not expect to live for a long time. But he kind of lives and dies by the sword. He has the utmost pride in his swordsmanship. And this book is a story about he, how he becomes embroiled in the politics of the upper, upper echelons of society. So it's kind of a, a book about court intrigue. It's not even so much political intrigue because a lot of it is very petty. It's more about uh, personal intrigue and how St. Vere gets pulled into the personal drama of the members of the high society that live around him. This is the first novel of its kind that I had ever read. Ellen Kushner has a really beautiful writing style. I really enjoy her prose. And this has a lot of positive representation of LGBTQ characters. And it was probably one of the first fantasy novels that I read that had that kind of positive representation. The main character, St. Vere, is a bisexual man. and even though uh, the relationship that he's in is a very complex, very dark relationship, there are a lot of very dark characters in this novel, um, the fact that he is bisexual has nothing to do with uh, that setup. That is very much an accepted part of this society. And it, like I said, was probably the first fantasy novel that I read that was like that. 
Um, though this is a standalone, there are two companion novels that I have not read and that I would like to read. I do own them, so I'd like to go on and read them in the future. But this was just such a delightful novel. Again, I think about it all the time. What really stands out to me was the prose and that kind of witty, um, backstabbing kind of personal intrigue that I hadn't really read in a fantasy novel before that. Uh, I would love to go back and see how this holds up after all of those years, uh, but it is one that I would highly recommend. It would make a great palate cleanser from some of those long uh, epic fantasy series. Number seven on this list is The Sword of Kai Gen by M. L. Wong. This is one of the newer books that is on this list. I just read it last year. And while it definitely gets a lot of positive buzz and it gets talked about a lot on booktube, I unfortunately don't think that it gets the recognition that it deserves from the wider book community. Uh, the Sword of Kai Gen is the story of a mother and her son, so the mom Misaki and her mom and her son, sorry, Mamaru, who live on a peninsula on the outskirts of the Kaiganese Empire. And on this peninsula lives a, an elite class of warriors who are expert swordsmen and also can control a type of elemental magic. And Misaki has married into one of the kind of highest uh, or most revered families in this cast of warriors. And she is trying to live out her existence as the wife of one, of one of these very important men and the mother to children who are growing up to train in this style of fighting. Uh, it sounds like a very straightforward uh, fantasy story, but what we get is actually an intensely personal exploration of Misaki, of her role as a mother, her passions as a person, and how motherhood and marriage and trying to fit yourself into societal expectations can chip away at the person that you are and turn you into a person that you don't even recognize. This is a heartbreaking novel. There's a lot of sadness in here, but there's also action. There's amazing fighting scenes. This book really has everything that I would look for in fantasy. You have the most complex, well-developed characters. There is a beautiful um, exploration of what it means to be a mother. There, There's just Everything about it is excellent. I really, really enjoyed this. Um, it is a standalone, but there are, I think there's a young adult fantasy series that takes place like several years after this book, but it follows completely different characters and I didn't feel the need to go on and get any more of that story. I really liked um, how this book wrapped up. I think some people tend to prefer the first half or the second half, depending on their tastes. The first half is much more character driven. The second half has a lot more um, action, but also has the resolution of some of the relationship arcs that we've been seeing over the course of the novel. But personally, I enjoyed the whole thing. I was very engaged from the beginning right to the end. And I would highly recommend that anybody who is looking for fantasy that explores some of those complex themes to pick up the Sword of Kaigen right away. Number six on this list is another older uh, work of fantasy uh, that was published in the 80s, and that is The Hero in the Crown by Robin McKinley. I have definitely talked about this book on the channel before, and that is because I have loved this book for so long. The Hero in the Crown was probably my introduction into epic fantasy that focused on a female character. Uh, this story follows the character of Erin, who is an awkward princess growing up in her father's court. Her mother was from outside the kingdom, and there's a lot of speculation about who she was, why she was there, how she became married to the king, and there's a lot of mistrust of Erin uh, just from the other people at court. She suffers a lot from other people's assumptions about her, and her various cousins and other high-ranking members of the court don't do much to shadow or mask their disdain for her. 
Aaron has some trouble manipulating the type of magic that is uh, representative of the court and that also makes her a little bit of an outsider. So what we follow in this book is Aaron trying to find a way to set herself apart and to become a hero for her people. So we watch her as she grows from awkward princess into someone who would like to be a knight or a savior for her people and it is such a satisfying and heartwarming journey. I have read other books by Robin McKinley since then and I have really really enjoyed them. I love her writing style. I think that she writes really strong female characters and that she often puts a unique spin on her books that you don't see in, in the works of other fantasy authors. Uh, much like Swords Point, The Hero and the Crown does have a companion novel called The Blue Sword, which I also really enjoyed, but this is a complete standalone, it has a complete arc, and there's no reason to read further in the series or in the, the kind of stand, to read this, the companion novel if you do not want to. All right, to break the top five, uh, we have the book The Night Circus by Aaron Morgenstern. So I've actually been chatting about The Night Circus a lot lately because I had been talking to Patrick about books that he absolutely hates and The Night Circus is one of those books for him. So this is where we have opinions that completely differ, which can make it really fun to chat about. Uh, but I really, really love this book. The Night Circus is difficult to describe because it doesn't really have a strong singular plot. So if you're someone who's a very plot focused reader, I don't think that this would work well for you. But basically the setup for the Night Circus is that there is a magical circus that shows up in towns without warning, doesn't give any indication that it's going to be there, and then just all of a sudden is. And it has this very magical atmosphere that draws people in and then when they leave they kind of leave feeling as though they have lived through a dream and in the backdrop of this magical circus there are two magicians apprentices who are on opposite sides of this epic magical battle and so their masters or their mentors have set up this competition uh, where they need to battle against each other unwittingly uh, to try to outmaneuver the other. And as they start building up these more complex uh, demonstrations of magic, they start to become interested and then they start to develop romantic feelings for one another. Again, I think some people take umbrage with the building the relationship in this book because you don't get a lot of direct contact between the characters. It can feel like the feelings arise quite suddenly, but I actually really like the way that the relationship plays out. Everything in this novel from the prose to the magic to the way that the relationship builds I think all lends to this magical, mystical atmosphere of the night circus. This was one of the most vivid settings that I have ever read. It is one of the most intensely atmospheric books that I have ever had the pleasure to read. So if you would like to read a book where you feel very immersed in the setting and where the plot and where the psychological complexity of the characters kind of falls to the wayside and you just get swept up in the whimsy of it, then that's, I think, who will enjoy The Night Circus. That is not always the, the type of book that I want to read, but I think that everything that Aaron Morgenstern did with this one just worked for me. I think about this book all the time. I loved it so much. And I think it's also a good introduction to fantasy for people who don't typically read fantasy. Perhaps for people who read a lot of historical fiction or romance or literary fiction, I think that this would be a great introduction. I gave this book to my mother-in-law who has never read another work of fantasy in her life and she also absolutely loves it. I think if you enjoy that beautiful style of prose and like I said, that magical kind of whimsical feeling, then you would definitely love The Night Circus. Coming in at number four is my Stephen King entry for this list and the book that makes it is The Talisman. So The Talisman is a book that Stephen King wrote with Peter Straub and it has the special acclaim in my reading history of being the very first Stephen King novel that I ever read. 
I read The Talisman when I was 12 and it, my dad had given it to me kind of as a precursor uh, before I read The Dark Tower. Um, the, the Talisman and The Dark Tower are not similar in all ways, but there are definitely some concepts that are explored in The Talisman that then become very important uh, as you journey along through the books of The Dark Tower. The setup for The Talisman is that we follow a young boy named Jack whose mother is very, very sick. And Jack finds out that there is a way that you can hop between dimensions or between worlds. And as you go into this second world, most people have what is known as a twinner. So they have a, a person, kind of a mirror image of themselves that exists in this secondary world. And in the dimension in which Jack hops, his mother's twinner is the queen of that world. And she is also dying. So Jack sets off on this kind of cross-dimensional, cross-country quest to save both the queen of this secondary world and subsequently to save his mother's life in his own world. So it kind of has that mixture of cross-country road trip, coming of age, that strange blend of fantasy slash science fiction that Stephen King pulls off so well. And to be honest, it's been a really long time since I read The Talisman. This is one of the books that I included in my Nostalgia Goggles video about books that I would really like to go back and reread. And I am feeling a little bit nervous about this reread because I have two people whose opinions on Stephen King that I really admire and respect who really didn't enjoy this novel. And one is one of my friends in real life who read The Talisman at my urging and then kind of said like, I can't believe this is your favorite Stephen King book. What are you thinking? And then of course, Mike over at Mike's Book Reviews, who has the Fantastic Into the Multiverse series, he also read The Talisman and really didn't like it. I remember feeling nothing but love for this book when I read it, and I have loved it for so long that it made it to number four on this list, despite the fact that I haven't read it for decades. And I am a little bit nervous to go back and reread it because I don't want to interrupt that love that I have. But I still feel like if you are looking for an introduction into Stephen King, if you like that mashup of science fiction and fantasy, then you should definitely give The Talisman a try. Edging in to the top three, we have my number three pick, which is The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien. I have talked at length about The Hobbit on this channel because it was my very first introduction to fantasy. Uh, my dad read this to me when I was five and I have been hooked on Hobbits and on Middle Earth ever since. Uh, I'm going through the very special experience right now of reading this to my kids and we are nearly at the end. It has taken a little bit of time, especially since my son is a little bit uh, more difficult to pin down for those long chapters than his sister, uh, but it has been such a rewarding experience. I love this book so much. I started to cry when I started to read it to my kids. It elicits a lot of emotion out of me, and I just, I it just holds such a special place in my heart. It is part of the foundations of my love for fantasy, and as such, it could never rank any lower on this list. Um, I think everybody knows what The Hobbit is about. We follow Bilbo Baggins, The Hobbit, as he departs on a series of adventures. So there's kind of an overarching adventure where he is helping a party of dwarves find their lost treasure, which is guarded by the dragon Smog. But each chapter in this book is actually an independent adventure where we get to see Bilbo discover some of his skills and find out a little bit about himself to discover parts of himself that he has never seen before. I think this is very much oriented towards children, but it is part of the greater Middle Earth lore, and I do very much recommend reading it before you embark uh, on The Lord of the Rings. They're very different in tone, they're very different in execution, but I think that they make up um, complementary halves to the total whole. And I love this book. I'm sure I will continue to reread it throughout my life, and if you have not read it, then just go read it. Had to take a little break for some dog barking because the mailman showed up at my door. Uh, but coming in at number two is Madeline Miller's The Song of Achilles. I really enjoy both of Madeline Miller's novels, uh, both Circe and The Song of Achilles. 
but there is just something special about the Song of Achilles. I have reread this book so many times since its release, I think nearly a decade ago it was released, and I find so much to love about it each time. It always rings the most intense emotions out of me and I love everything about it. So The Song of Achilles is Madeline Miller's retelling of the story of Achilles from the perspective of Patroclus. And this is a, uh, a retelling in which the two are romantically involved and we get to see Patroclus's relationship with Achilles develop from this kind of timid, fledgling friendship into kind of the deepest, most impactful friendship, and then on to the deepest, most impactful romantic relationship. And it is beautiful to watch the development of this relationship from Patroclus's perspective. I think Madeline Miller gives us a story that we have seen in film, that we have read, that we have seen retold so many times, and I think that she brings a fresh perspective to a story that felt like it had nowhere else to go. I sympathized with Achilles, I empathized with Achilles, a, a character who in many of the other permutations I found very difficult to connect with because of the arrogance that was there, because I felt like there was very little that was human to forge a connection with. And through by telling this story through Patroclus's perspective, we get to see the brightest parts of Achilles. We get to see the softened edges of that intensity, of that ambition. And we get to see his human side as opposed to the godly side of him that I think is uh, expressed so often in the mythological retellings. I think the prose here is beautiful. Madeline Miller writes with such gorgeous simplicity. I really enjoy her uh, her writing style and this is just a book I think that will resonate for a long time. It is heartbreaking. I mean we all know how the myth goes uh, but being able to experience that through Patroclus's perspective adds a layer of heartbreak that I think exceeds anything else that I have ever read in this story. This is one of my favorite books of all time, bar none, if we're talking fantasy, non-fantasy, standalone, non-standalone. It is just one of my favorite books and I really, really encourage people to read it because it is not too long, it is beautifully written, and I think it is the perfect palate cleanser. I haven't spoken to many people who disliked this book, to be honest, and I think that it is it's great for fans of historical fiction, for fans of fantasy, for fans of literary fiction, for fans of romance. So many people can enjoy this book and I highly, highly encourage you to pick it up. However, we have come to the very last book on this list, my favorite standalone novel of all time. And if you have spent a lot of time on the channel, then you likely know what this is going to be, but it is Watership Down by Richard Adams. Watership Down was one of the very first adult, I say adult, it, it probably could be classified as um, children's literature, but I think it's one of those classics that kind of transcends any categorization, but it is one of the full, first full length fantasy novels that I read on my own. I was around seven or eight years old when I read Watership Down for the first time, and I have read it many, many times since then. Watership Down is the story of two brother rabbits, Hazel and Fiverr, who live in a warren, and Fiverr, who is gifted with some form of um, psychic powers, has this premonition that something horrible is going to happen. And so he and Hazel gather up a few of their closest friends and break out and escape from their warren and go to seek sanctuary and seek a home of their own in the English countryside. Uh, it sounds like a very basic setup, a very basic adventure type premise, but I think that there's a surprising amount of depth in this novel. You do get that surface adventure, which is perfect for sharing with kids, but there's also an, an exploration of a lot of deeper themes here. We, we talk about the theme of complacency, of dependence, of um, independence versus uh, letting others take care of you and 
decide what is going to happen in your life. There is a fascist regime that the rabbits have to stand up against. We get to see courage and loyalty and bravery and what it means to stand up for your friends. This book was one of the first ones to introduce me to the idea that the rabbit that everyone looks up to doesn't have to be the smartest. They don't have to be the strongest, but they need to have that that indefinable quality that brings people together. It talks about uh, what makes a true leader and how you can be the best uh, for your people or for the people that follow you. I love this book so much. It also introduced me to the idea of having your own language in a fantasy world, something that the Lord of the Rings would greatly expand on when I read that a couple of years later. But it was my first introduction into having that uh, vocabulary, that singular vocabulary for a novel. These rabbits have their own deity, they have their own mythology, and their mythology, which follows the trickster rabbit king, Elerera, is interwoven throughout the story and, ha and has parallels with what is happening in Hazel and Fiverr's life. And the lessons that are imparted by Elerera help them on their quest and help them to find their way out of trouble or to figure out what to do next. Uh, this is very much a band of friends who are working together. We have the rabbits who are the smartest and then the ones who are the strongest and the most courageous and everybody has a place in this rabbit society and they all work together and I think that that is a beautiful message and they are such a fantastic group of characters to follow. This is a classic in fantasy for a reason. You can see echoes of it in other fantasy works. Uh, you can see echoes of Watership Down and some of other Richard, Ad Richard Adams' other works in the Dark Tower series, which when I was first reading them were the most delightful Easter eggs because my favorite series had been integrating parts of what was and probably will always be my favorite novel. So I think that these books, or this book, has had a, a big impact on some of the authors who are our favorites today. If you have not read Watership Down, if you are only going to read one book from this list of my 10 favorites, then I would highly encourage you to make this your selection. If you have read Watership Down and you either enjoyed it or did not, then please let me know because I would love to hear other people's thoughts about this novel that I love so very much. But that is, those are my 10 favorite fantasy novels. I hope that this was enjoyable and I would love to know if there's any overlap. If you have your own personal lists, please feel free to put some of your favorite standalones in the comments below and I really look forward to reading them. I will see you in a couple of days with a video about my favorite fantasy series and I hope you have a great day. Bye.